I'm unbelievably excited for this week's episode because we're going to be discussing some heterodox economic theory, namely post-Keynesian economics, with my good friend Cartesian Otter. Uh, Post-Keynesian economics is a school of heterodox economics that builds on the framework provided by John Maynard Keynes, Michael Koleski, Piero Sraffa, and several other core contributors. Uh, Post-Keynesian economics is unified in its approach to properly understanding economics by focusing on the principle of effective demand, the theory of income distribution and value, and a monetized production economy, to name a few of its core tenets. Uh, This episode is probably going to be a very theory-dense esoteric musing on economics. Uh, The past episodes have generally been about the history, theory, and policy of social democracy, but this one's going to be a little bit of a deviation from the norm. But still, I hope you guys do enjoy it. Hello, Mr. Cartesian Otter. Thank you so much for being in the interview. How are you doing tonight? I'm doing fantastic. Like I just ate my dinner today and that has me like all pumped and thrilled for this podcast. Yeah. So you had some really interesting Indian food to eat. So I was a a man after my own heart. Yes, sir. uh, Yeah. It's a, it's it's a winner's diet. I think it'll fuel you through this really interesting conversation we're about to have on a very heterodox uh, branch of economics called post Keynesian economics. So I'm really looking forward to getting into the nitty gritty. Uh, but before we start, do you want to introduce yourself uh, and give uh, a background, any kind of projects that you're working on and also drop your social media? Sure. Um, so hi guys, my name is Cartesian Otter. That's what my Twitter at is. Um, people call me Otter um, and I appreciate that as well. Um, as for what my experience is, I've been studying post Keynesian economics for I think it's been about a year or so now. Um, I recently got introduced to it by, um, funnily enough, by watching one of the YouTuber Unlearning Economics videos. And through there, I sort of found my way through heterodox economics. Um, And I got interested after reading a little bit more, um, as I'll mention down the line. But currently right now, I'm working on um, reading more material as I can because I'm currently focusing a lot of my work on studying growth theory, so how economies evolve over the time and how economies grow over time. So that's what I hopefully will share about later on in this podcast. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to hearing about that. So yeah, let's get right into it. So can you, and I'm going to guess that a lot of our listeners are not going to be very familiar with this because this this seemed to be a very on the fringe kind of heterodox uh, economic theory, but can you give us like a simple breakdown of what post-Keynesian economics is, just to the layman? Alrighty. So in economics, we usually try to focus on like very broad variables that we want to consider. So like inflation, unemployment, um, growth, et cetera, et cetera. Now, with that being said, what we're usually taught in like economics classes, so like Econ 101 or Econ 102, like your basic intro classes, there tends to be not enough focus on pluralism of thought. So what I mean by that is there's not differing views of opinions offered on how um, sort of economic theory can be approached. Um, You guys are not often taught about Marxist lenses or even Austrian lenses, for instance. And so post-Keynesian economics is a heterodox, heterodox in the sense of not traditionally taught in economics curriculum. Post-Keynesian economics is a heterodox school. So um, the reason why it's considered heterodox is because it's not very much considered to be in the orthodox or the curriculum that forms the blueprint from what goes on in like contemporary economics thought. Um, as for basic tenets or like basic questions that post Keynesian economics concerns itself, well, first of all, post Keynesian economics focuses on the role of production and growth. So, how can we consider real and monetary variables. So not only do we consider the real aspects of the economy, so like employment or um, capital stocks, or et cetera, et cetera, but we also try to consider monetary variables, so so like the money supply and stuff like that. So we want to try to create a sort of broad paradigm that tries to push as much info related to um, understanding these sorts of concepts, which is why I take to post-Keynesian economics 
Um, as for a brief history, if you mind. Um, Go right ahead. So post-Keynesian economics, um, as you could tell by the name post-Keynesian, um, it originally derives from sort of like Keynes's general theory, which was published during the Great Depression. At that time, there was much focus on unemployment because after all, the time was severe. And so there were much calls for trying to understand how can we get um, out of this global depression. From there, in the 1950s, after the, um, World War II, we started to see um, individuals such as Nicholas Caldor or Joanne Robinson trying to develop models of growth and understanding how sort of economies evolve over time in the long run. So like a span of like several tens of years. Um, and then from there, funnily enough, we actually got involved into some controversies with mainstream economics in the 1960s and 70s. Um, while that was going on, there was also much um, work being done on the theory of the firm. So how does uh, business set its prices? Um, how does employment theory works? And so that sort of stuff was associated with the Polish economist, Mikhail Kaleski. And he conducted much research on um, oligopoly theory, which was understanding how firms work in um, limited or constrained markets governed by few firms. So that was his sort of like understanding or like his sort of work related to that aspect. Um, side note, Kaleski was also a Marxist, but not sort of your orthodox Marxist. Um, for instance, he didn't believe in the labor theory of value as um, his one distinguishing point from orthodox Marxists. And then from there, you start to see um, in the 1980s, 90s, and the early 2000s, you start to see implementation or application of sort of what we understood in, in the 50s and 60s, and we extended that work into understanding like more sort of application work. So like economic policy, um, understanding empirical work, um, monetary and fiscal policies, and new attempts at synthesizing the various branches in post-Keynesian economics. So in the 2010s era, which we um, just recently passed, there was much um, focus on trying to construct a model of understanding uh, macroeconomic variables. And that model was considered to be um, the stock flow consistent approach, which I'll get into shortly after. But yeah, so that is sort of like a basic timeline of post-Keynesian economics over the previous 80 or 70 so years. Cool. I think that's a very uh, great uh, breakdown, and it kind of leads into the second question that I wanted to ask. Uh, so as you said, you know, uh, post-Keynesian economics is a heterodox uh, school of economics that is meaningfully different uh, from the prevailing neoclassical regime that includes a uh, like a liberal Keynesian side and also like a conservative side. Uh, can you kind of delineate all three of these uh, and what is like the main theoretical underpinnings of these three and what, how are they meaningfully different from each other? Right. So um, contemporary wise, we have the new Keynesian school of economics. Um, that is usually what is taught. And that is usually what prominent economists that you see, such as um, Greg Mankiw, being considered. Um, for one, um, on the topic of growth, because um, I specialize in growth theory, um, we kind of sort of reject traditional views of constrained growth. So in new Keynesian economics, there is a general agreement on growth in the long run being supply constrained. So like what I mean by supply constrained is um, an economy is constrained by its resources. So like scarcity, that's the notion of scarcity that has been present in neoclassical economics mm -hmm. and its various incarnations. Um, Post-Keynesian economics, on the other hand, we also try to include supply constraints um, as we see in sort of like international growth theory, which is associated with the work of Nicholas Caldor, but we try to place a greater focus on demand. So understanding how um, investment fuels the economy in not just the short run, meaning in like a short span of time, but also in the long run. So the reason why post-Keynesian economics thinks that growth is demand-led in both the short run and the long run is because there tends to be idle capacity, meaning idle capital that is not fully used because of some underconsumptionist theory that Keynes adopted early on too. So we try to continue that 
legacy of Keynes by adopting the principle of affected demand, which basically states that a, an economy is demand constrained. Um, there's another sort of big differentiating point between New Keynesian economics and post Keynesian economics. Um, I like to mention that New Keynesian economics um, adopts this sort of model that's called loanable funds model. And mm -hmm. in this model, they consider the money supply as being dependent on savings. So if there's a higher amount of savings stored in the banking sector, then that means there is greater opportunity for investment or private investment, I should say, to occur. However, post-Keynesian economics thinks that money creation in the sense of how the money supply is altered is endogenous to the banking sector. So what I mean by that is whenever a bank credits a loan to, say, uh, a consumer um, to purchase some goods or either to a business to go on to invest, by extending that loan, what you have is you're creating deposits because by extension of that loan, which is kind of sort of like a, a fund that you need to pay off later on, that mm -hmm. fund goes on to pay for whatever cost or sort of like whatever goods you seek to buy. So for instance, in everyday life, um, consumers may try to use credit cards. Um, from those credit cards, you actually technically borrow money, but it's not necessarily borrowing money. It's more like you take that money that has been granted to you because you were a qualified consumer, meaning you had, I don't know, maybe a worthy sort of like credit score. And mm -hmm. you go on to take that credit card to purchase goods. And so you might purchase, I don't know, maybe a drink at Starbucks. That loan of, say, like $5 that you use to purchase that drink goes on to make a deposit in the Starbucks um, deposit account. So what you see is um, the money supply is independent of this quantity of savings. And the fact that the conditions of how money is created is contingent upon real aspects of the economy. So for instance, in times of recessions, what you see is banks being hesitant to loan or credit accounts because they do not want firms to fail their investments. Otherwise, they're making losses on their interest payments. And so in that sense, inflation is determined not just by monetary phenomena, such as um, like the money supply, but it's also determined by real factors or uh, more appropriately, more appropriately, conflicting claims inflation, which is sort of like, it's very much um, similar to what the classical is considered to be the surplus approach, which um, the Sraffian branch of post-Keynesian economics focuses on. So those are sort of like the big two differentiating points out there between new Keynesian economics and post-Keynesian economics. Okay, cool. That's a, I think that's a, that's a apt description. Uh, I think obviously like the kind of conservative neoclassicals are way out of the pale. We're probably talking about, you know, like Austrian theorists. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what is, what, I don't know how much you've read on them, but like, what is their kind of main um, offering to the branch of economics or heterodox economics? Like what is their kind of structural underpinning? Well, I haven't, um, to be honest, I haven't looked into much of Austrian economics. Mm -hmm. um, however, I am aware in terms of economic history that neoclassical economics shares some founders with Austrian economics. Um, I think one name comes to mind is Karl Menger. Mm -hmm. um, apart from that, I have little interest in Austrian economics at the moment. <laughs> That's fair. That's I think that's a very it's a very fair lack of interest to have. Uh, so anyway, before before this podcast, I wanted to and you've offered me readings before in post Keynesian economics. So I've, over the past couple of months, I've done a little bit on my own time of reading. Obviously, not to the level uh, of uh, that of scrutiny that you are at, but uh, I've come up uh, of these as their primary concepts in post Keynesian economics through those readings and also through what you've talked about. Uh, so I think the four that stuck out to me was a that concept of effective demand that you were talking about. 
about earlier. Uh, B, the idea of historical and dynamic time. C, as you mentioned, the theory of income distribution and value. And D, the monetized production economy. Can you kind of go through these four concepts and explain them? I think you can spend a little less time on effective demand since you kind of brought that up in your last answer. Right. So with the concept of effective demand, it basically states that an economy is demand constrained. So um, your components of demand are consumption expenditures, which is like basically going out there and buying like consumption goods. So, so like drinks or food, et cetera, et cetera. Um, investment, which goes on to expand um, capital, such as like machinery. Um, you have government expenditures and also exports, net exports. Um, this principle basically states that rather than an economy being supply constrained, so like in terms of its resources and productivity, um, a, an economy is demand constrained. So as a result, what you have in within the post-Keynesian paradigm is that you have considerable amount of modeling that goes on that demonstrates that, for instance, in my own field of expertise, which is growth theory, there tends to be much focus on demand because we consider demand to be the primary driver of what an economy and how an economy grows throughout time. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so one more thing related to the concept of effective demand is that rather than, well, there's a simple causality that's related to um, investment and saving. Um, neoclassical economics basically states that um, investment is driven by saving. So if you increase the amount of saving, you increase investment. However, mm -hmm. um, post-Keynesians reverse that causality. So investment causes saving. And that's sort of related to the paradox of thrift, um, which mm -hmm. Keynes talked about briefly in general um, theory. And that's basically stating that if you try to increase the amount of saving in an economy, what that does is it lowers the amount of consumption expenditures going out to businesses. And so by lowering that revenue for businesses, what you have sort of is this um, dynamo effect where um, by lowering revenues for businesses, you also lower their prospects for investment. And so in that sense, we state that investment causes saving in the sense that investment generates that new revenue, which then goes out, goes on out to income earners who can later go on to save more than they would um, in a like sort of normal scenario. As for mm -hmm. the second principle, which is dynamic or historical time, um, we argue that any sort of considerations of theoretical modeling that goes on in the in a long span of time, so like the long run, we argue that that sort of time span, that large sort of time span is reliant on a series of short period positions. So what goes on in the events in between um, prior to getting to that final position at the end of whatever sort of long time span you have, you need to consider that long position, that long run period is contingent upon what occurs in those short-run periods. Mm -hmm. um, as for the, the as for the principle of monetized production economy, that's basically um, arguing that we should consider monetary aspects as being um, going in hand with real aspects. So you have scenarios where real aspects can affect monetary aspects. So for instance, um, during the Great Depression, um, when housing construction fails, um, what you see is banks also failing too. And reason why is some banks were also, um, they also made out loans to these um, housing businesses. So what you see is banks trying to increase their interest rates in order to try to maintain their profitability. However, um, because firms, or I should say housing firms, failed, um, some banks also failed, which is why um, the U.S. and other governments had to step in to prevent that sort of stuff from happening. So you see sort of like this dual role of monetary and real aspects, which is why post-Keynesians also emphasize 
the nature of trying to consider both real and monetary aspects of the economy at the same time. Mm -hmm. And there was the, uh, what about the theory of income distribution and value? Right. So the theory of income distribution and value. This is sort of like more related to the Serafian branch of Mm -hmm. Keynesian economics. And that's basically um, taken from consideration of the classical economists. So like Marx, Ricardo, and Smith. And that was um, in their in their approach, the classical approach, they considered a scenario where an economy is viable because it produces a social surplus, um, aka um, any sort of real product that is positive out of what is needed to for the economy to continue production. So, for instance, if an economy set um, produces 10 units of corn every year, um, and you need six units of corn as seed um, to continue the cycle of production and two units of corn for workers to um, eat and consume and sort of survive. Then you have two left over, which then constitutes the surplus. So in that sense, um, the post-Keynesians also consider um, the theory of income distribution and value deriving from the classical approach. Which is why you see some post-Keynesian authors also um, calling post-Keynesians as classical Keynesians because they also like to emphasize the nature of classicals and their role for influencing um, the post-Keynesian branch, including the Serafian school or Serafian mm-hmm. branch. Mm-hmm. Okay, that's a, I think yeah, that's a great breakdown. Thank you for that. Uh, so we, you, we've talked a little bit about these uh, figures, um, you know, people like Sarafa, Kolaski, uh, and Keynes. So who, who do you think are the, you know, primary figures in the development of post-Keynesian economics? And what do you see as their most important contributions to the, the current paradigm and uh, theoretical underpinnings of uh, post-Keynesian economics? Right. So with that, there's actually so many figures related to post-Keynesian economics, like <laughs> We've borrowed so many aspects from like various like minute schools out there that haven't even been heard of like at all, like even by some post Keynesians. Um, however, I think there's some major figures out there in terms of post Keynesians history that um, have contributed notable um, works to um, contemporary work related to post Keynesian. Post Keynesians. Um, one of them, of course, is John Maynard Keynes, and mm-hmm. like some of his concepts have been like emphasized throughout, like not just um, growth theory, but also like several other fields, so like monetary, um, microeconomics, et cetera, et cetera. Um, for that, I think he brought up like several paradoxes. Um, one of which I mentioned briefly earlier, which was mm-hmm. the paradox of thrift. Yeah. Um, he also discussed um, the theory of effective demand and um, fundamental uncertainty as well. Um, mm-hmm. Another author that you have is Michael Kolesky, and mm-hmm. he worked a lot on oligopoly theory um, with one of his auth- um, co-authors, which was Josef Steindl, if I'm pr- pronouncing his name correctly. And mm-hmm. um, with those two, they contributed a lot to um, the post-Keynesian understanding of oligopoly theory, how firms um, operate, and the pricing behavior of firms. Um, and funnily enough, Michael Kolesky and some of his work was later demonstrated to contribute to Kolesky and growth theory. Um, in fact, there have been contributions of Kolesky and Steindl um, that have been emphasized in Kolesky and growth theory, such as um, the utilization rate of capital, which is basically what percentage of the capital stock is used in um, production. Um, as for some other authors, um, of course, there's Piero Srafa, who revived um, the classical approach. Um, there are also other like less mentioned names, such as um, Philip Andrews or Gardner Means, that have also contributed to pricing. Um, Mm -hmm. In fact, if you'd like to learn more about um, post-Keynesian price theory, I would strongly recommend Frederick S. Lee's um, post-Keynesian price theory. Um, He details um, Gardner and Means' approach to pricing, Philip Andrews' approach to pricing, as well as Kolesky's approach to pricing. Mm 
Um, as for some other authors, I know that there's like so many authors out there. I'm just trying to list the big ones mm-hmm. out there. Um, we have Nicholas Caldor, as I briefly mentioned earlier. Um, during the 50s and 60s, he also contributed to um, early post-Keynesian growth theory. Um, he later on in the 70s, I believe, he focused a great bit on open economy constraints. So in that, he actually considered international trade, balance of payments, and the real financial nexus, which is basically um, how the financial sector um, works in tandem with the real sector. Um, and I think that's about it as for like major figures. I mean, I have a list of at least 50 names I could read out right now, but I don't mm-hmm. think anybody would be interesting, <laughs> interested in reading that many names. Well, hopefully we'll be able to, uh, have access to your Google drive that we can, and we can put a link to it, uh, in the YouTube if, in case people want to peruse in their own time. But I, I do know you have a... Uh, an extensive catalog of all these post Keynesian authors. So it's really exciting. Um, okay, so I want to move into a little bit of what uh, people were asking for in, uh, in in Twitter when I put out uh, a call for questions because I was going to be interviewing you. Uh, so here's some from them. Uh, so what? So we've talked a lot about you know theory, uh, and we've had some musings on the like the esoteric kind of. Uh, underpinnings of post-Keynesian economics, but what are some policy positions that you'd pitch as a post-Keynesian? Oh, like that's what, 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 yeah, what do they look like in action? Interesting. Okay. So prior to reading this sort of like a little bit of a tangent, but prior to actually me getting into growth theory, I actually did some readings about like labor market theory and mm-hmm. within labor market theory, I, um, learned about several concepts related to um, how the labor market works, as well as how economies grow, of course, because those two are in tandem, Um, one of which is demand regimes. And demand regimes basically refers to the nature of demand. So if demand is wage-led, we say that the regime or the nation being considered is... um, going to stimulate more of its GDP or growth by shifting more of the income distribution towards the wage share. So that's the instance in the Nordic countries, so like Sweden, Norway, and Finland, um, they have strongly wage-led demand regimes. And the reason why is because there is centralized wage bargaining, there are active labor market interventions, so like you have unemployment insurance, um, you also have manpower policies, um, actually, fun fact about manpower policies, um, back during the 80s, there was a book published by um, some post-Keynesians and um, labor market organize sorry, not labor market, labor union organizations um, from Nordic countries. And in that book, there's a chapter actually written by um, Rudolf Maidner, and he actually talked about the role of manpower policies. It's a phenomenal book that I would recommend. It's called Barriers to Full Employment. Mm-hmm. Um, as for like going into like labor market policies, I would say centralized wage bargaining is one mm-hmm. of the big topics that or big policies that um, post Keynesians would like to see implemented because that would help to increase the bargaining power of workers as well as mitigating inflation because there is a possibility of wage price spi- spirals occurring because as wages, um, as bargaining for wages continues to rise excessively, um, then you could see like sort of price inflation. And so with centralized wage bargaining, you could actually combat two problems, which is one, stagnation of workers' incomes, and two, mm-hmm. combating um, wage price inflation. Um, as for other policies, I've um, read a little bit about social wealth funds. I think mm-hmm. there has been an economist related to um, understanding social wealth funds as um, stimulating public investment because Keynes himself also suggested the notion of um, socialization of investment, which isn't necessarily socialism as he was cautious to word it that way, but it's mm-hmm. it's technically public investment on the part of the public entity, which is the government. Um, in order to stimulate um, investment. 
Um, as for other policies, um, I have heard of a job guarantee, but that is more closer to the MMT, mm-hmm. um, MMT views of, or yeah, so MMT views. Which, um, which we'll be getting into, yeah. Um, a, a lot of uh, people on uh, you know our side uh, of this project are uh, pretty vehemently against uh, kind of jobs guarantees, but uh, I, I think we're going to get into that in uh, the question after this one. Um, but yeah, on to the next question. Uh, what are some of the main critiques of post-Keynesian economics and um, what are your responses to them? Um, that's actually pretty funny because I haven't heard any major critiques of PKE because, um, um, then again, you also have sort of like lack of engagement, um, both on an academic scale and on sort of like a reader wise scale, like in the sense of people actually being interested in post Keynesian economics. But I've heard one critique of post Keynesian economics as being irrelevant or sort of like being based off of some old um, figures that have already passed away and it's best to adopt a better lens. Well, I wouldn't necessarily say that it's good to adopt a better lens because in fact, our world is suffering from many problems and I think it is more advantageous to not just um, the the profession as a whole, um, but also advantageous to people of the world that we also adopt diversity of thought, which mm-hmm. I think should be stressed in all professions or all academic studies, whether mm-hmm. you're an economics major or not. Um, I think that in itself, diversity of thought, is a major reason why we should try to try and strive to include more post-Keynesian talk about economics, as they have offered numerous contributions, as well as even getting involved into controversies with um, the broader mainstream or orthodox um, economics. Okay, that's that's a good answer. Okay, so now 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 for the one that you've been waiting for. Uh, what what are your thoughts on modern monetary theory? Because within our circles, there seems to be a kind of split amongst people that do seem to be in favor of it and those that are against. Uh, I know this is a contentious topic for people that you think you're very ideologically aligned with, but some seem to uh, kind of poo-poo it away. But you, 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 I assume, are a supporter of MMT. So what, what are your thoughts on MMT? Well, I haven't really focused a lot on like MMT policy positions wise. Um, I know there has been a lot of rhetoric involved, involved with MMT. Um, one of which is, of course, taxes don't fund spending. And one could probably infer from that that, oh, you should try to cut taxes um, because if spending does not rely on taxes, then what's the point of increasing taxes? Um, thing is with that, um, MMTers, I, I've talked briefly with them about this. I may be misconstruing things. I may be misrem- misremembering things about this. So... I would proceed with a word of advice. Um, don't take my words seriously about MMT because <laughs> I myself have not engaged too much with MMT. Um, as for theoreticals, um, I've heard numerous contributions of MMT, um, specifically MMT figures like Landall Ray with regards <laughs> to monetary um, theory. He has also contributed a lot to um I believe, some macroeconomics textbooks too. So I generally have like a neutral stance towards MMT. I know it's like a more vocal um, opinion that's out there, especially now because we have even politicians such as AOC um, suggesting that we should bring MMT onto the table to discuss. Mm-hmm. Um, as much as I know, I'm, I'm sort of like ambivalent towards MMT because I haven't really studied too in depth into MMT to make any sort of strong comments on that. Um, I will say that MMT is really close to post Keynesian economics, especially on like the monetary aspects too, like the monetary theory. So, um, if, and then again, I'm not too familiar with monetary theory either. So mm-hmm. I have sort of like no strong, um, comments to be made on MMT at the moment. 
Yeah, I, I mean, so I think if I could distill how I think people like, you know, you've talked with David Sliger about this a little bit. You guys have had a little, uh, you know, back and forth on this. But I think what I specifically look at with regards to MMT is that I, I do think it's a useful tool to wield when we're saying that, hey, you like, you know, there's no need to uh, deficit fear monger as much as we do. It's OK to run federal deficits, which seems to be one of the kind of main pitches of um, uh, MMT. But I find that it kind of falls a little bit short when it comes to the taxation side, because everybody on this side is very like pro uh, broad based taxation. Uh, so we feel like it's harder to sell the argument for kind of increased uh, taxation because it's a way of building kind of a more broad class solidarity and we think it's like a little bit harder to get uh done uh if you if you just say hey like you know taxes are kind of pointless because it's just all done on the spending side the taxes are just a way to suck money out of the economy when inflation is high and then kind of destroy it the government doesn't really need to do it so i we we think it's like a little bit harder uh to, to sell the kind of tax system that we'd like to see as social democrats or democratic socialists and and the kind of lineage that you do see in nordic countries with how broad uh, and high their tax rates are. So I think that's that's where we generally come from. And also, I think the job, I think jobs guarantee is also one of the things that's been, uh, you know, kind of embedded into, you know, the mainstream kind of ideological MMT. Uh, that's something that uh, people on our side are a little bit uh, hesitant of. Uh, but I think I, I do think, you know, you know, deficit fear mongering is kind of a pretty silly thing to worry about right now. Yeah. Anyways, um, sorry. If I, yeah. Do you have any response? Could, yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to touch on briefly on the um, taxation um, combating inflation. Um, as for that point, I think that's a little bit um, too exaggerated in media circles because um, I've talked with so, um, some MMTers about this, and I've also been reading a lot about this from Joe Weisenthal, who um, is in charge of the Odd Lots podcast on Bloomberg, I believe, um, mm -hmm. who is also friendly to MMT. And... They've had like numerous contributions on supply side constraints. And so I wouldn't necessarily jump to the conclusion that taxation is the tool to combat inflation. Rather, it could be a tool. It might not be as effective as um, other tools, such as like um, public infrastructure spending, as we see going on right now. Um, but apart from that, yeah, I have no other um, comments to be made on. MMT. Yeah, so I think that just is my final comment on this. I don't want let, I don't want to drag this out too much because um, it's getting pretty late out here. But so um, I think you, as, as social democrats or kind of classical social democrats, what we we tend to see taxation as more than just a tool. We see it as like one of the kind of primary ways that you can sustain a welfare state. Uh, the idea that, you know, as a citizen of a country, you deserve this uh, amount of social welfare is something that you buy into, as every fellow citizen does. And this kind of makes it harder to gut these welfare programs over time because people are used to spending into it. So this is this is this is why like this is why tax positivity has been a huge thing for us. We want to um, kind of reduce the um, hesitancy that, you know, people have to taxation. Uh, and, you know, we want to, you know, have, you know, maybe like lower salience taxes, but we want to keep kind of ratcheting up that taxation because we see that as like a fundamental building block in the sustenance of a long term welfare state, uh, which, you know, at, in the end goal is, you know, like political, social and most importantly, economic democracy. And we don't we don't think that can happen without just really broad taxation. Uh, but those are my last words on it. Um, but why don't we move on to the last question? This is a fun one. Uh, so what are three book recommendations that you would give to someone to introduce them to post Keynes and economics and why? And I know you've read like many, many, many books, but uh, if you had to pick the, your favorite thing. Yeah, this is a funny question for me because I've been a bookworm for the past like couple months. Like, in fact, <laughs> it's been so bad to the point where my mom's been calling me a bookworm too. It's like, get off the computer. Why are you still reading? I don't know. Lavoie or Wait, an, in, an, in, an Indian mom is saying you're reading too much? Yep, I know. That's, that's surprising. That's problematic, man. That's <laughs> that, that, I'd be worried about that. <laughs> anyway, sorry. Yeah, it, it's it's been about like grades, like why are you not having 95% or above in classes? But no, none of that applies to me. It's only about the reading. <laughs> but yeah, um, as for book recommendations, um the first book I would say is Mark Lavoie's um, Introduction to Post-Keynesian Economics. Um, I say this mm -hmm. in mind, knowing that it might be a little bit simplified for those people that are interested in more in-depth or in-depth material or 
have already had some experience in economics, but I generally recommend Lavoie's Introduction to Post-Keynesian Economics because one, it's pretty short. Mm -hmm. I think it's about 150 pages long. And two, I also have accompanying uh, notes for it, which hopefully will be linked in the description, um, which is which is part of my um, broad library um, library esque folder. But yeah, I would generally recommend intro to introduction to post Keynesian economics because it touches a little bit more on the um, tenets um, regarding post Keynesian economics, and it briefly goes on goes over pricing as well as growth theory, which I was very fond of since the start of reading that book. Um, as for the second book, um, I would say that um, Mark Lavois's New Foundations, post keynesian Economics, you see a sort of trend going mm-hmm. on with the titles, but um, I would generally recommend that book because that's a little bit more broader in terms of um, it covers more aspects related to post keynesian economics. It goes over monetary theory. It goes over inflation theory. Um, it goes over growth theory. In fact, you have so many functions in growth theory that you might as well just take notes for those two. Um, but that's a really more in-depth, broad um, material that I would generally recommend for readers to go into right after they have finished um, Mark Lavois' shorter book, um, Introduction to Post-Keynesian Economics. Um, as for the third book, um, this is a little bit like undecisive on my part because after mm-hmm. you finish New Foundations, you could jump about um, in whichever theory of post-Keynesian economics you'd like to go into. Um, me personally, I started immediately in macro modeling don't do that. I had to read 600 pages um, of monetary theory, and I had to take about 150 pages of notes just for that book. It was Jeez. intense. I strongly advise against that. However, um, if mm-hmm. you'd like to get into a little bit more history regarding post-Keynesian economics, because Lavoie might not cover as much about history, I would generally recommend um, Jeffrey Harcourt's Structure of Post-Keynesian Economics, The Core Contributions of the Pioneers. Um, It Mm -hmm. sort of solidifies what you've already learned from Lavoie's New Foundations, as well as from Lavoie's Introduction of Post-Keynesian Economics. But it goes into more sort of um, broad-based terms. So like you have more mentions of the classical economists, so like Ricardo... Um, and Marx, and you also have sort of like more contrast with the mainstream views. So like it goes in depth, I know a little bit about um, the neoclassical growth theory, which he goes over too. Um, And I would generally recommend that as the third book. But from there, you could go about in whichever books you'd like. Um, There are several theories that you might get into, monetary growth, um, microeconomics pricing. I generally recommend you guys to go to the Post-Keynesian Economic Society reading list, which will, which should also be in the link in this podcast when mm-hmm. it goes up too. And that has a more detailed approach towards a reading list or like a more um, detailed um, detailed um, material list because it includes articles it includes books it includes chapters from books and i strongly recommend that um list because i also started from that list too and it's a really good list for anybody that's interested in post keynesian economics all right perfect thank you that's all the questions i had for you today do you have any uh, any for me do you have any uh, closing remarks any closing comments um, yeah so i'd like to give a shout out to my post keynesian economics discord server um, which shall, which should mm-hmm. also be in the link in, in the podcast when it goes up. Um, Absolutely. We, the moderation team and I, are currently setting up a book club, which um, we're undecisive between Lavoie's New Foundation or Harcourt's Structure of Post-Keynesian Economics. But we're deciding on an introductory book, and we'll also be doing presentations on those books. So... Um, if you are going to join the book club, please do make sure to join the book club because 
it's going to be an in-depth review of what you already read. And it's also from like more experienced people such as myself and um, some members of the moderation team. Um, we also got some content rolling out too. Um, I'm personally starting some presentations. Um, I'm trying to get some equipment to start video lectures about um, simple concepts related to post Keynesian economics. We also have um, a lot of professional economists there too. So we have Nathan Tankus. We have, I believe, um, Unlearning Economics. We also have some post Keynesian economics too. Um, so I strongly recommend you guys to go join the post Keynesian Discord server. Um, another thing is make sure to check out my post Keynesian economics reading material, which should be in my folder. That is grouped according to whichever topics of interest you are interested in. So if you're interested in Koleskian economics, which is a branch in post Keynesian economics, I have a folder for that. If you are even interested in monetary economics, I have that too. I have pretty much everything that's related to basic or intermediate post Keynesian economics. All right, perfect. We'll have all of these linked below. Uh, I would recommend any listeners who are interested in post Keynesian economics or even learning about what you know heterodox economics can look like, even if you're not fully invested in post Keynesian economics. I would reckon I would recommend that you go follow Cartesian Otter. I would recommend joining the Discord or at least perusing some of the things that he's written about on his Google Drive. And if I recall correctly, you have a blog also. Yes, sir. I have a blog that currently goes over growth theory. It's titled Inquiries of Macrodynamics, which I'll also be linked into um, the bio of this podcast, too. Okay. All right. Perfect. So thank you so much, uh, Otter, Mr. Otter Baji, for coming on to the interview tonight. This was a real pleasure. Uh, thank you for taking time out of your day to do that. Thank you for inviting me here.